so today's word is we believe the Bible is God's word. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness. And that simply means that even if you don't believe that the Bible's God's word, there's nothing that the Bible's going to tell you to do wrong. The Bible does not direct you in a way to ruin your life or upset your life or cause confusion in your life. So even if you don't believe that the Bible's God's word, the Bible is still there for those reasons to help you. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 31, and I'm going to be given a lot of different scriptures, so you might just want to jot some of them down. So in Deuteronomy, chapter 31, verse 9, it says, So Moses wrote down this law and gave it to the Levitical priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and to all the elders. So when God gave Moses the word, Moses wrote it down, Moses gave it to the people, and then that word was so important that it was carried in the Ark of the Covenant everywhere they went, everywhere they moved from place to place. That's how valuable the word was. Now we believe that the Bible is God's word. Now this is not a message to try to convince you that the Bible is God's word because you pretty much know or don't know. But I'm not going to try to use a whole bunch of scriptures. I'm going to be speaking today to a group of people who believe like I believe, that the Bible is God's word. And you don't need no convincing. You already know it. You've already felt it. And you live it. And I'm also going to speak to a group of people who questions the Bible. It doesn't matter how many prophecies that you seem fulfilled. It doesn't matter how many things you can take in this world and relate it to the Bible, you still gonna bring about question because that's just how you are. I'm also speaking to a group of people who's just looking for the truth. You're looking for this truth, you got an open heart. You got an open mind. But what happens is, People come toward you. The world come at you and tell you what to believe, what to think, things about the church, things about your Bible. You know, it brings about questions. But you don't care because you are still here because you're going to plant yourself until you find that truth. I did that a long time ago myself. I was questioning a lot of different things and I didn't know. I said, I'm gonna stay one way or the other. I'm either gonna find something that's gonna run me away or I'm gonna find something that's gonna keep me. And guess what? I stayed, I stayed because I found what I was looking for. I'm also gonna be speaking to some skeptic people who already have their mind made up about the Bible. And they just here listening just to gather up some information just to bring about more confusion, more questions, and more doubt. And last, I'm speaking to a group of people who, hey, I hope Minister Pam can prove to me that the Bible's God's word. Because if she believes it, and she can prove it to me, then maybe I believe it. But maybe that might happen today, maybe not. But I'm going to need some help from some people out there because I know there's some people out there who believe, just like I do, that the Bible is God's word. So if that's you, you're one of those people who believe that the Bible is God's word, you can help me out. And the way that you're going to help me out is, when I say a scripture, and you happen to know that same scripture, say that scripture along with me. And we're going to start with this one. Y'all should know this one. Romans 10, 17. Help me out if you know it. So then, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And see, as we do that, the people sitting around us know that. Oh, you're one of them people who believe that the Bible's God's word. But that's good because 
I told you the group of people that we're going to be talking to, and some of them might need just a little extra help, not from me, but from you because you're closest to them. Now, we're going to start off in Matthew chapter 4. You can turn to it. I'm not going to go through the whole book. But in Matthew chapter 4, Matthew 4, 4 says, Man, y'all can help me off, y'all know this, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Wow. But now, listen, in this chapter, Matthew chapter 4, Jesus was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, at the end of his fast, guess who comes? Satan. Jesus is tired. Jesus is hungry. Jesus is thirsty. And here comes Satan. Oh, yeah. That's what happens. Satan figured, yeah, I got you now, Jesus. You're weak. You're tired. But nope. Jesus said to each and every temptation that Satan brought up, it is written. It is written. Jesus used that over and over. Every time Satan brought up different things that he wanted Jesus to do, saying, hey, you could do that. You know God's going to send his angels. But Jesus says, it is written. Because guess what? Jesus used God's word. And if Jesus used God's word against Satan himself, you should use God's word. And I'm sure if it worked against Satan, it will work against your enemy, your boss, your children, or whatever temptation might have you doing something. Use God's word. Now, in the years of Jesus' ministry on earth, he faced all kinds of challenges. And a lot of those challenges came right from the leaders, the people in the synagogue. They came and they challenged Jesus. Oh, they wanted to destroy the ministry altogether. But Jesus didn't back down. And Jesus did not let his enemies, the leaders, crushed in him with their, hey, if you're the son of God, save yourself and save us too. And how about, why don't your disciples do this ritual or do that ritual? They're not paying taxes. Come on, Jesus, what's up with your disciples? You're not following the rules and regulations that were set up and set forth. Or how about this one? Here, Jesus. Here's this woman caught in adultery. What you gonna do about it? You know what the law says. You go ahead, Jesus. You're our leader now. Do something about it. Jesus didn't respond. Because we do not have to answer all the questions that people bring to us. People sometimes bring questions to us only to bring about confusion, for disbelief, we don't have to answer them type of questions. It just doesn't make no sense. You know, questions like, you were at church today? There's a hypocrite at church. Oh, you know what? The next time you go to church, ask your pastor this question and see what he has to say. We don't have to respond to stuff like that. Those are just questions to bring about the joy that we've already had. We, we don't need them. You can't believe everything in the Bible. You don't have to respond to stuff like that. People like that, you need to pray for. We're not in the convincing business. At least I know I'm not. The Bible, God's word, does it all by itself. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter three. Hebrews chapter 3, beginning at verse 12. And I'm going to read 12 through 19. Hebrews chapter 3. And it says... 
Take care, brethren, that there not be any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ, and if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end, while it is said, y'all can help me with this one, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as when they provoke me. Now, who provoked who? Verse 16 said, for who provoked him? When they had heard, indeed, they indeed did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses, they were crying to go back. They were complaining. Do we do that? Complain, cry. They wanted more and more and more. In verse 17, and with this, whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? They didn't want to follow. They remember they ate the manna. They saved that. I should say they saved the manna. Then they woke up and they had worms. They stole stuff that they wasn't supposed to steal. In verse 18, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Christianity is based on the belief that comes from the Bible being God's word. If I don't believe the Bible's God's word, how could I even be a Christian? Other Bibles, other religions will use the Christian Bible through some part of their religion along with their other books. Now help me with this one. Romans 10.9. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now I want to talk to you today like I'm talking to a friend. Because, really, if you don't believe that the Bible's God's word, you're condemned already. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus is the word that became flesh. But I guess it doesn't matter because if you don't believe, you're condemned. Second, if the Bible's not God's word, where do you get God's word from? Do you just tarry and just wait? You know, do I just sit down and just wait until Jesus comes through the locked door and then I'm able to put my hand, you know, where, where his wound was and just wait and then I believe? No, that wouldn't work either because if you don't believe the first part, which is the death, then... You can't get to the burial, the resurrection, or any of that. You know, I really don't want to sit here and go through a whole bunch of scriptures because the scripture is God's word. But I know me, I'm going to go through a whole bunch of scriptures anyway because I believe it's God's word and how else I'm going to prove to you that it's God's word if I don't go through a whole bunch of scriptures. Wait, I just contradicted myself. Skip it. It's okay. Uh, what, what, what I'm, what I'm going to do, you can pick my word apart all you want to, but you can't pick God's word apart. <coughs> Help me with this one. Y'all know this one. John 10, 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. 
I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Now I want to tell you a parable. You know, Jesus talked a lot in parable because Jesus wanted people to really think about his word. You know, sometimes it's real easy to give somebody an answer or to tell somebody how to do something or to do it for them. But if you have to actually do the work at the same time, then you understand deeper. Now, Jesus talked a lot in parables and, and a lot so that people who wanted to understand had to get into the word to understand. So in Matthew chapter 13, you can go there if you would like, and most of you probably know this, this is the parable of the seed. It's in Matthew chapter 13. So in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus gives this parable. He says, a farmer went out to sow the seed. And as he was scattering the seeds, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. So let's just imagine that. You just throw seeds out, the birds come and eat them up. Next, he says, some seeds fell on the rocky places where it didn't have much soil. So imagine that. You know, you see the ground with the little cracks in it, so you throw the seeds. Some of the seeds fell down there, and it fell in the crack. It says that it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Now, other seeds fell among the thorns. You can imagine that. And the thorns grew up and they choked the plants. Still other seeds fell on good soil where it produced a crop. A hundred, sixty, even thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. And remember, Jesus was talking to a group of farmers. Today, Jesus would probably have to give us a microwave version <laughs> because we don't know a lot about farming. Most of us have never farmed in our life. So this example worked great for them back then because they understood about planting the seeds into good soil. Now, when we go down to verse 18, it says, listen then to what the parable of the sower means. So verse 19 says, when anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their hearts. Now this is the seed sown along the path. Y'all know these people. They're the ones that say, I don't understand anything that the Bible says. They just don't get it. They don't understand anything that the Bible says. I don't understand y'all church people. <laughs> Verse 20. The seeds falling on the rocky grounds refer to someone who hears the word and receives it with joy. Oh my, they're so happy. They heard the word. They just loved it. They were at church. They felt so good. But since they had no root, they lasted only a short time. As soon as they got in their car. <laughs> when the trouble <laughs> or persecution came because of the word, they quickly fell away, is what the Bible says. Y'all know them people. Those ones that used to believe, those ones that used to be on fire, those ones that you thought would never change, but if there's no root that is built around it, which is the Bible, it crashes. Verse 22, the seed falling among the thorns refer to someone who hears the word, but the worries of life and a de deceitfulness of wealth choke the word out, making it unfruitful. Y'all know these people. I believe, but I, 
I'm not going to make them changes in my life that I need to. But that's right. I believe, but I don't have to believe all of that. I believe, but, man, that's a party next week. So y'all know them people. Verse 23, but the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word, understands it, and this is the one who produces a crop yielding 100, 60, or 30 times what was sown. You know these people, the one who reads, study, witness, and obey God's word. Now there's something that I really don't know how I know for sure that the Bible's God's word is just like the song, truth. You just know. And I can't even really tell you why. I can tell you that the Bible has been God's word since way back in time. Your grandmama, your great grandmama, and your great, great, great grandmama believed that the Bible was God's word. What has changed is the believer, not God's word. God's word sat for years in 2 Kings 22 because of unbelief and sin. God's word was hidden, but when Hilkiah, the high priest, presented the word to King Josiah, and this is in your Bible, and it was read to him, he was moved by it. He broke into tears, and he began a cleansing for himself first, and then for the nation. And how about Jonah? During the days of Jonah, the people was wicked. They lived any way that they wanted to. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Because we lived any way we wanted to at, at a point in our life too. And we deserved separation from God. Then people lived any way they wanted to and they deserved separation from God. I know. I was one of them. But let me tell you, today, I live according to God's word. Now, when Jonah went to the city of Nineveh and presented the word, when the word hit the king, the king dressed in sackcloth and ashes, and the king began a cleansing for himself first and then for the nation. And the nation began to change. That God's word is alive. I was convicted when I heard God's word. And when God's word got deep down in my heart, I began to cry, just like Josiah. Didn't really even know why I was crying. I just knew that it was that point in my life when God's word reached me. And I began my cleansing. I began to look at every part of my life and begin to look at what did not connect with God's word. And I began my cleansing. And that was before I had children. So <laughs> I, can't, I, I can't cleanse grown folks. <laughs> But that was before I had children. But I was able to raise my children according to God's word. Something about us believers, we know the truth. I don't know how other than that the Bible says the Holy Spirit has revealed it to us. That's the only way I can explain how we know. I wasn't there when they wrote these books, but I do know the truth. And I'm so sure of it because of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 13, the book of Matthew, chapter 13, beginning at verse 
16. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see but did not see it and to hear what you hear but did not hear it. I remember my sister coming to visit me. She had such peace in her life. And I, not that I didn't go to church, but I knew something was missing. And sometimes you just know something is missing. And I wanted what she had. She had that peace. And when I got it, after the tears, such freedom, such freedom, and I know you can relate to that. Now, during the days of Paul, he was, during the days of his preaching, Paul entered this one city, and he looked around at all the religious artifacts, and he sees a sign that says, to an unknown God. That's in Acts 17, 22. Paul then stood up and he says, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walk around the city and I look carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar to an unknown God. Paul says you are ignorant of the very thing that you worship. Let me tell you in closing. They didn't know which God, so they tried to cover all the bases, trying too hard to be right. Don't make it complicated at all. Don't make it complicated. Ephesians, the second chapter, the 10th verse says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Good works are a manifestation of what you know and believe. That is why the scriptures are there to teach, to correct, to rebuke, and to train you. The word of God is your guide to what is right, pure, holy, and truthful. And it's there so that you might believe and not have to worry about all the false stuff that comes your way. You have the word of God that you can use to look at for yourself. And the word of God is there so that you might do things to please God. The Bible is God's word. As you read it, you'll begin to see that. Being saved is not a labyrinth. It is deciding that you want peace. You really want to know for sure? how we do it, how we Christians know for sure that we're following the only true God. You want to know? Give your life to Jesus today. God has already designed the plan of salvation. Jesus came, he walked the earth, lived a sinless life, and he became the perfect sacrifice. You don't need no other sacrifice. He died and he rose again. Now if you want to give your life to Christ today, you can say this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. I believe that Jesus died on the cross just for me. 
I ask forgiveness for those things that I've done, even for things that I've done and don't know that I have not pleased you. I ask you to give me understanding and knowledge so that I may walk the long haul walk, be a part of the good seed that brings others to the fold. I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. Amen.